What you're about to hear is part six of a multi-part series on no-holds-barred fighting in America. I'm your host, Patrick Euclid. Previously on the Cage of History. Patesh, exhausted, unable to mount any offense, is getting need in the dome now as Don Fry walks his leg up the cage and drops it into the skull of the Brazilian. Oh, goodness. Four or five knees now, and he's punching the back of the skull. He's just got to land a few more of these knees here, I feel. Punches again. Oh. I think the referee's stopping the contest again now. Yep, that's it. He's calling the stop of this contest. The main event of UFC 9, Motor City Madness. Pathetic by the standard just set by Fry and Batesh. Shamrock versus Severn 2, or Severn versus Shamrock 2, however you want to bill it, is easily the worst fight in UFC history, and perhaps in all of NHB. And there have been some extremely suicidally sad elephants in the circus of fistic shit shows. They circled and maybe occasionally played a little patty cake coming into the pocket, but mostly circled for 30 minutes, like insects trapped in a mason jar by a sociopathic preschool kid, refusing to fight even when shaken against the glass by the sheer weight of the crowd's deafening disappointment. Dan Severn won the fight by split decision, but at the end of the night it felt as if nothing had happened at all. The lack of a tournament champion and the failure of the superfight to satisfy in any meaningful way left the show in Detroit a disaster for Semaphore. The next show would certainly feature a return to the tournament format, and in a town that would tolerate their type of entertainment, with little possibility of litigatory tumult. What did you expect? Welcome. Welcome, son. To the cage. Make yourself at home. Of history. You've got to remember that these are just simple farms. Episode 6. These are people of the land. The Wild you know, South. Morons. Dan Severn had just captured both the Ultimate Ultimate Fighting Championship and the Super Fight title, and was, ostensibly, the baddest man on the planet. So, of course, the Japanese were courting him, coaxing him to appear in one of their events, the third Valley Tudo Japan card. Due to some problems they'd had with the format in the previous year, like a couple of competitors loser-bracketed their way back into contention, they decided to hold single matches in lieu of the tournament. Dan was paired up with a man he submitted in three and a half minutes. I didn't watch it. UFC 10, held five days later, would feature a tournament. In fact, it would be subtitled the tournament. Just to make sure everyone knew that that shit in Detroit was just a one-off. It would feature no super fight, with the tournament final serving as the main event. In fact, technically, the worst fight of all time, Severn Shamrock 2, would be the last super fight. But that is a detail perhaps best explained a little bit later. The pushback that SEG had faced in their last three events, not to mention the fallout from Battlecade Extreme Fighting, forced them to seek refuge in places that would allow them into the local economy with open arms. As it turned out, some of the friendliest spots to this dubious spectacle of disgusting savagery were states along the Bible Belt. The Expo Square Pavilion in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Fair Park Arena in Birmingham, Alabama. The Augusta Civic Center in Georgia. So like 5,000 people in the stands tops. The primary source of revenue 
pay-per-view purchases took a serious hit with the number of buys their last show had done, with the Canadian providers effectively banning them of about a quarter of their market lost overnight. The David and Goliath show, arguably their most successful, had done double the numbers that Motor City Madness managed, and the results that UFC 10 produced continued the downward trend. There was still a strong contingent of hardcores holding on, nearly a hundred thousand strong, ordering every broadcast or renting every tape, and the quality of the production continued to improve, as did the athletes. There was a sense that, even if it was banned in all 50 states, they'd move into Brazil or Japan or Australia or the UK, they'd scatter like coyotes under the political persecution and find refuge wherever possible. You know, They'd go off the reservation, figuratively speaking. Onto a reservation, literally speaking. In Birmingham, Alabama, July 12th, 1996, a martial arts event The tournament featuring field would feature Moti Horenstein, a number of standout competitors, Mark Coleman, including the return of Gary Goodridge, Gary Goodridge, and the man who defeated Brian him, Johnston, to become the UFC 8 champion, the Predator. Don, Don Fry. Fry. He would be taking on the returning and Mark, Mark Hall. Hall in the first fight of the opening UFC round. UFC 10, the tournament. It would be the first fight in a trilogy Bruce between Butler Fry and Hall, announcing and the only one to really matter. A shadow of his older brother. It was memorable, and the action begins in part just because it was a Don Fry fight. The predator Don Fry immediately taking the spinning back kick from Mark Hall. He immediately clinches and slams him to the mat. In a half guard of Mark Hall now, he's punching the ribs continuously with his right hand. And with his previous performances, his elbow, pinning the jaw of Mark Hall down. Proving himself to be the most just attempting to regain full guard, but unable. Rootness, tootness, baddest ass motherfucker to be found in these here parts. If he can clear his right leg. Don Fry should be past the guard, but he's put back in full guard now as he as he stands, attempting to get some leverage to punch Mark Hall in the face. Hall is having none of it. Back down to the mat. Don Fry relegated to punching the ribs with his right hand. Three more good strikes to the ribs of Mark Hall, the Muye Do black belt. Mark Hall with a skeletal grip. He needs to overhook the right arm instead of the left one as he is drubbed. Many more times here by Don the Predator Fry, beating the ribs of Mark Hall as he does nothing but hold down the head. Oh, a headbutt from Don Fry here. And again, rubbing into the ribs of Mark Hall with his right. But also due to the damage that Hall sustained to his ribs. His posture still broken down in the full guard, the full open guard I might mention, of Mark Hall. Mark Hall hanging on for dear life in a preposterous display of grit, being blasted in the ribs over and over on one side. Outmatched and on his back, Mark not attempting to escape, being beaten like a supine heavy bag and refusing to quit. As Don Fry once again gets some separation, oh some uppercuts from Hall, at least he's working here now. His strategy appears to be to break down the posture of Don Fry, and when Don Fry separates, the punch with his bare knuckles. Don Fry going back to the body with a few punches, smothering the face. Don Fry's got some separation. Mark Hall must have been blasted about 200 times to the body. His forearm bladed across his throat. He's going to the left side of the body now. Punching away, refusing to release the grip that broke down Fry's posture. Don Fry, he couldn't be knocked out this again, way. Again, punching to the ribs with the left hand. Posture broken down, attempting to push through the clothes. But he dog also couldn't escape or improve his position. Of Mark Hall, or defend the bodywork. Mark Hall, attempting to kick the kidneys now as he's taking punch after punch. Oh, that there, there's. There's bruising on the ribs already of Mark Hall. And either the impressions of the ribs 
or the knuckles of Don Fry, I'm unsure. Paul not attempting to block. Hmm. Paul's mouthpiece has popped out now. Don Fry attempting to elevate again, punching the ribs again. Punching the ribs. He's punched his ribs about 50 times now. Good solid shots. Come on, Paul attempting a, a butterfly sweep, but uh, that has only pushed Don Fry into his half guard. He's attempting to escape. He's regained full guard now as Mark Hall opened guard. Getting drubbed in the ribs again by, Mar by uh, Don Fry is Mark Hall. Helpless here on the mat. Crushed between the elbows, forearms of Don Fry and getting his ribs bashed in by short hooks downstairs. The Predator again blasting to the ribs. Another five good shots here. Oh, a big headbutt from Don Fry. Attempting to get that separation. Oh, we're blasting the ribs again, but we can't see due to that bad camera angle. Four shots to the ribs. I can see the, the body of Mark Hall jerk from the opposite side when he's blasted. Don Fry again stacking up. This is just a savage beating to the left side. About six more, seven, seven left hands from Don Fry to the ribs. Oh, Don, uh, Don Fry catches a couple of, of bare knuckle punches to the ear, but he comes back with a, a few headbutts to, to Mark Hall. He's elevated up again now, punching the ribs on either side. Seems as though our time may be running out now. Now oh, we've got another good three minutes left in the round. Don Fry punching the ribs. Oh, we get a good angle here and we can see the damage is visceral to the body of Mark Hall on his left side. Those ribs look done. Take them out the barbecue. Palpable, thudding, wax from Don Fry. Don Fry now has Mark Hall pressed all the way against the cage. His head pinned against the chain links. He's now able to punch the head. Oh, now he goes back to the body. He looks to the referee as though asking, what kind of color sauce would you like on these motherfuckers? They are red, but they will quickly become purple. Oh, a big uh, clubbing hammer fist from Don Fry into the eye. Mark Hall implores someone to shut up. In my memory, the coaches in his corner implored him to surrender. More punches. Don Fry, Mark Hall, a tough son of a bitch, not giving up. But taping, taking budding shots to the ribs now on the left side. The spare ribs. More punches from Don Fry. Oh, big punches from Don Fry as he's postured up now. Uh, defended only by the left leg of Mark Hall. He could easily lock it up, but he, he's not going for that. He's just trying to, to crush the face, the jaw, the temple of the Muyedo black belt. Again, punches as his posture is broken down on the left side. Hammer fist to the face. Another from the right side. Don Fry is actually getting tired now. Tired of whooping this ass. In my memory, Don Fry asked him to submit deep into the match. Oh, a big headbutt. And more punches to the ribs. The purple ribs, which I imagine will turn black within minutes after this fight is over. Big punch to the jaw from Don Fry. As he has so far 
completely dominated this motherfucker. In my memory, even Big John McCarthy begged him to quit. Although that, that can't be right for her. Paul was talking to his corner again. Quit with honor, they'd said. He's, he's saying that he can't. Some advice? His ribs may be broken here. He, he might possibly not be able to get up, but he's not going to give up. I can't. That's what Mark Hall said. I can't quit. The implication that I took away Ooh, big was that he wanted to. But he just couldn't bring himself to do it. And negotiating with the referee to stand this fight. Oh, he's stopping. He's, he's stopping the fight. He's, he's picking up Mark Hall off the mat for some reason. Oh, Mark Hall is quite injured. Some men are simply too tough for their own good. I fucking love those guys. And that's it. I think, I think that's it. He's asking the Dr. Richard Estrico to take a look. I can't imagine the doctor will say. Nope, as they're calling it a TKO victory for Don Fry. A good call, as they are both exhausted and they embrace. Tom Selleck's retarded younger brother is telling this man he's, he's a tough son of a bitch or something. Great sportsmanship. He, he respects the fact that he would not quit. One good kick landed for him. From Mark Hall, spinning back kick. Didn't quite get the liver of Don Fry, but he was immediately clinched and slammed to the mat. From there, it was just torture. The other side of this story, UFC 10, Monty Hornstein, the tournament, looking like Justin Timberlake's retarded older brother, was Mark Coleman against a standout from Mark the wrestling Coleman. community. Looking like lauded by the Olympic gold medalist commentator Jeff Black. Steroid machine. And the action begins. Monty Hornstein immediately charging with a push kick. Coleman shoots low, but he slips out. Coleman easily pushes him over and passes into Mount. He's punching now. Big punches from Coleman. Then Monty Hornstein, who is... He's got his legs up like a frog. He's unsure what to do in this position. It is not good. He's attempting to roll out. He might get choked here. But Mark Coleman is being patient. Now drumming the back of the neck with one punch. Oh, he's, he's flattening him out looking for the choke. Mark Coleman, another left hook. Monty Hornstein in trouble as he's attempting to stand in bad position. Mark Coleman, another punch over the top. One to the ribs. A big, powerful Pan American Games wrestler is just having his way with this karate champ. He is a younger, stronger iteration of the ultimate, ultimate, and super fight champion. Coleman here and out as Multi Hornstein attempts to punch back, but it is not very effective. And while he is very green, Coleman just thinking about how to finish. Coleman going to the ribs now, like forcing Multi Hornstein to turn. A Mojave rattler. He's attempting to push down the arms, which are breaking his posture to stand up and punch. He's got a cross space. He's made some separation now and he's landed a solid right hand to the jaw. Moti Hornstein has Mark Holman headbutts from Mark Holman. Operating on pure instinct to supplement his amateur Two wrestling. solid headbutts landed there. Oh, Moti Hornstein has turned his back. He is a force of oh, he's nature. He's turned back over now. In mm. science. Mark Holman's still in a tight mount. Moti going for the over. He's a highly decorated freestyle That's wrestling. Uh, Coleman's got him in this cradle position here, as he's in half guard, ha side control rather. This is some bizarre ass grappling here. But as there are no bucks to be made in that racket, Mark Coleman just holding down the man at this stage of his life. Back into his half guard. Why? Why Mark Coleman? What are you doing? He's working as a doorman at a nightclub. Mark Coleman using some raw fury. A punch over the top. This might not exactly be historically he's accurate. He's just a big, strong wrestler who's looking to land some good punches. Oh, a knee, good knee lands for Mark Coleman as he's using his brain and now. And I'm uninterested in that in any case. Needs to use his brain by putting his forehead into Monty Hornstein's face. In my version of history. Hornstein attempting to attack with the heels to the kidney. Mark Coleman is a bouncer. Mark Coleman going back to the body. One of those big, bull neck bouncers that just think about bouncing. Ooh, big punches over the top land for Coleman as Monty Hornstein covers up his face. And Big John McCarthy has stepped in to stop the action. They go home and watch Roadhouse and think about bouncing Patrick Swayze. Coleman pacing and stalking around like an angry gorilla. Of course, bouncers don't usually need to finish people. 
that's kind of a liability, honestly. They just need to be able to throw a dude through a door, or make him want to go through it himself, beat him into the fetal position, hands covering his face like a weeping Elmer Fudd. Don Fry's propensity to strike had thus far in his UFC career been incredibly exciting. It had led to an ability to overcome tricky bullshit with persistent pressure. But it also got him into trouble. He was slightly undersized in this day of open weight, and especially in this tournament setting, you can't afford to have a whole lot of exciting fights if you want a chance in hell. But to hell with the chances. Fry was just an exciting fighter. The American Kickboxing Academy has produced Brian Johnston, Javier Mendez trained, a judoka as well. He compares his style to that of Don Fry, who compares his own style to a hybrid of Oleg Taktarov and Marco Huos. At this stage of the game, Fry, still undefeated in the UFC, these two are probably top tier in terms of technical ability in multiple disciplines. Super heavyweight Golden Gloves champion, Brian Johnston, and tight American flag shorts, both men with gloves, Johnston barefoot. Kicks are legal for him, and it made for a main event level fight. Don Fry walks to the center and immediately shoots in. Johnson responds with a knee. It's a shootout immediately as they exchange lefts and rights back into the clinch. Johnson attempts a short punch as Fry pushes him to the cage. A big knee lands for Don Fry. A clubbing right hand for Brian Johnson responds. They're now punching each other with right hands against the fence. Uh, hockey style. Here. Don Fry has one leg laced in. No, he's not going for that now. Br uh, Brian Johnston looks like he's going to attempt a throw over the top with his powerful wizard, but no, he lands a, an inside knee, quick inside knee. As his back is still pressed against the fence, he attempts to turn out, and he does so, pushing Don Fry against the fence. All right, now, Johnston has pushed his way back into the center. Don Fry landing a big knee to the body, returned by Johnston. Don Fry turns out and attempting to push Johnson to the fence, who comes back. Fry lands a good headbutt, and they're punching now. The crowd is going crazy. They shoot back into the clinch. An uppercut lands for Johnson, possibly. Oh, a big knee for Don Fry. Big left knee up the center. As Don Fry has been pushed to, to the cage, he now reverses the position. He's pushing Johnston, who circles out. They're walking back to the center of the octagon in the Greco-Roman clinch. Big knee for Johnston. Big knee for Johnston up the middle. Another one he attempts. A clubbing right hand. Oh, two good right hands land for Johnston against the fence here. As he's got Don the Predator Fry pinned along the perimeter. Don Fry very relaxed. Oh, another knee for Johnston. He attempts a right hand, but it's a little too short. Don Fry now defending with knees as he's being walked back to the cage. And Johnston breaks away and returns back to the center. Oh, a uh, low kick does basically nothing. Don Fry right jabs his way into the clinch again as Johnston attempts to land another knee. He pushes Fry's back against the cage once more. Oh, a big clubbing right hand for Johnston. Oh, and a knee into the front balls of Fry for Johnston as he bounces back off the fence. They walk back to the center. Don Fry's got double underhooks. He's attempting to lift his man. He does so, and he throws him to the ground. Brian Johnston is turtled. And Fry puts one hook in for the, the back right. He's now clubbing the back of the neck of Johnston, who's been flattened out. Big punch there. Attempting to control the far ankle. Attempting to control the wrist of, of Don Fry, his right wrist. Don Fry. Punching to the body on the far side. Elbows, big elbows from, from Don Fry into the kidneys. Fry attempting to flatten the other man out. He's looked like he's going for twist to side control, but that can't be the case. Big punches from the back from Don Fry into the kidney. Johnston is just pinned here with his ass in the air. All right, now... Now, uh, Magnum P.I. has returned to a more based center. Again, 
Johnson attempted to shrug him off, but he's unable to. As he's laced his hand through the far leg, a clubbing crack smacks the skull of Brian Johnston from the Predator Don Fry. Johnston rolls through, and he, he clacks Fry's head against the mat, but he's unable to shrug the big man off. At the end the smaller of which, man, technically, huh? both were battered and exhausted from the back and forth Don battle. Fry, he's flattened him out now in side control, in regular ass side control. All right, and elbows to the face from the Predator. And like I said before, Johnston taps. You can't afford to be excited. There's a big gash on the forehead of Brian Johnston, possibly from that last elbow. And it's a submission victory for Don Fry in 4 minutes 38 seconds. Mark Coleman, though, couldn't avoid this pitfall in his semifinal fight. And the action begins. Gary Goodridge charging across the ring in his black gi. At Mark Coleman, who is circling on the outside, shoots low for his leg, a double leg, into the open guard of Gary Goodridge. He's shrimping up and sitting in. His raw ability led to some awkward positions. Coleman standing in the tripod stance. He's got his arm in danger, but Goodridge is not capitalizing there, of course. He's just attempting to smash down the jaw of Goodridge. Both of these heavyweights working here. Oh, big punches from Goodridge from the bottom. A big headbutt. Oh, many headbutts from Coleman. As he's attempting to cover the mouth of Goodridge. Sneakily, uh, maybe gouge him in the eye. Like an asshole. Get your fucking fingers out of that man's face, Mark Coleman. Mark Coleman putting his hand on the mat like a, like a complete white belt. As he's drubbing the ear on occasion, Gary Goodridge just breaking down the posture in his gloves in the closed guard, perhaps hoping for a stand-up. Coleman landing a nothing punch, a little, a little baby, thing, and headbutts to the chin of Gary Goodridge. More headbutts, a result of the unrefined rage and savagery he had to harness to Hulk smash his way to a finish. Oh, open fingers on the face of Goodridge again from Mark Coleman. And another headbutt up top. These short chopping headbutts seem to be the only effective shots that he's landed so far on Big Daddy Goodridge. Again with his open hand on the face of Goodridge. And when your opponent is kind of a Hulk smash dude himself. Coleman postured up heavily. His posture still broken down though as he's attempting to hold down Goodridge, who will punch as soon as his head comes into view. The action can get jammed up awkwardly. Big John McCarthy warns about a stand-up for inactivity, and Coleman lands maybe one good punch over the top as he is pushing his fingers into the face of Goodridge. Goodridge, with a grip on the cage, turns around into side control for Mark Coleman. Goodridge may escape here. Nope, Goodridge has turned over. And a bit of a back ride here. Mark Coleman has got the, uh, the, the body lock. Gary Goodridge with his hands clasped against the chain links. Uppercut by Coleman. Oh, another uppercut slides in. Popping up the head of Gary Goodridge who is just attempting to block the throw here. Hmm. Uppercut lands. Gary Goodridge smiles as he walks along the edge of the fence like a beginning swim student searching for his cornerman like two bucks trying to extricate themselves from the clash of antlers. Mark Coleman attempting to blast him. He should just be attempting to jerk him off the fence here. I think he does there. Alright, now in the corner of Gary Goodridge. His corner is telling him to under elbow, which he's afraid to do. Possibly because he may be thrown. Ooh, a big uppercut lands for Mark Coleman. Smacking the head of Goodridge. This fight was exciting because both men... All right, he turns out. Uh, Goodridge, uh, still with the grips on the cage, is attempting to turn out. Good deal. He does so. Unwieldy giants with narrow wheelhouses. Now Mark Coleman, looking exhausted, 
while well, Gary Goodrich looks fairly bored. He turns Mark Coleman's back against the fence now, unbelievably, and attempts to land a knee to the balls. It is blocked. Could pull out an amazing answer at any moment. All right, now Coleman escapes and takes the back again. We're back in the same position. And uppercuts are landing from Mark Coleman. Gary Goodridge refusing to let go of the fence with both hands, speaking to his cornerman. He's saying the back elbow. Pop, another right hand over the top. Right hands for Mark Coleman here. Between desperate solutions to unfamiliar problems. Now some toe stomping bullshit going on. Another good left uppercut for Coleman. Oh, a big uppercut for Coleman on the left side. And another one as Goodrich is attempting to move his body to avoid these punches. Roll with him at least. A lot of them are snapping his head up. Coleman needs to do a one-two, like, like an uppercut hook. But that is not in his wrestler's arsenal. Oh, big back elbow lands for Gary Goodridge, I think. As they're scrambling along the fence in this bad camera work, Coleman breaks away into the center. He may be stunned. He's looking for to do some footwork here as Big Daddy Gary Goodridge is looking to land a punch or a kick. Jab lands for Coleman as Goodridge thinks too much about it. Coleman circling on the outside. Paints a jab again. Gary Goodridge threatening with feints. He can't cut this uh, huge octagon trademark off here. Oh, a big left hook whiffs for Gary Goodridge as he punches into a double leg takedown from Coleman. He attempts to guillotine and sprawls his hips out amazingly. Now we're in side control. And uh, Coleman attempting to land some knees. Coleman punching. Coleman with a grip on the gi and right hands are landing. Clubs. Inside control for Mark Coleman here. A knee to the head. Ineffectual. Oh, Goodridge exposes his back. Coleman takes it quickly. He's, he's got an arm under looking for the choke. He gives it up. Goodridge turtling up. Coleman with both hooks. The flattened back mount. And Gary Goodridge taps wisely. As he is locked down in the flattened back mount by the freestyle wrestling champion Mark Coleman. He just took too much punishment here. Mark Coleman, the winner in seven minutes. Stalking around the cage like a slightly less angry gorilla. Maybe like an orangutan. An ill-tempered orangutan. As Leon Tabs takes a look at the face of Goodrich, which looks relatively unmarred. In the main event, and the action begins, well... I'll let the man speak for himself from his UFC Hall of Fame induction speech. Both men in the southpaw stance and Coleman shooting under Fry in the front headlock position. Coleman's put his hand down on the mat. Coleman magically takes the back of, of Don Fry, a short drag off the headlock. Here's Don Fry, quote, a much bigger, uh, more talented freestyle wrestler here is Mark Coleman. 20 years later, I'll admit, I almost didn't come out for that final fight with Mark Coleman. I remember after I beat Brian Johnston in the, finals, in the semifinals, I ran my fingers through my hair, and my hair was bone dry. All right, now Fry has turned out. He's He's got one butterfly hook against the cage. Oh, Coleman going for big punches. A swarm of punches as, as Fry has pushed him away with his, his legs. There's no fluid in my body. I had nothing left. Coleman driving his hips into Don Fry here, and as he lands a big punch, he's just a much bigger man despite the uh, only 31 pound discrepancy. And Coleman was waiting for me in about 12 minutes. Oh, big punches from, Scary shit. from Mark Coleman. Oh, thudding! I thought about against the face. Making an excuse and pulling out. Of the champion here. It crossed my mind, I'll tell you that. Don Fry getting swarmed in the corner. The open hand technique again. As he's Coleman has pinned uh, his head against the fence. Boyce did it. And he is punching to the body. Shamrock did it. The hand fighting. 
Fry grabbing the fence and attempting to scoot his hips out unsuccessful. So maybe I should do it. He's trying to make small incremental adjustments, but he's already getting busted up. And, and especially in that right eye, which he came into with a bruise on. Oh, posturing up now is Coleman. But then I looked at the guys that they had for alternates. Thinking about how to drop these hammers. Fry attempting to push away. Coleman a few more chopping blows to the head. Would have been criminal to send one of those kids out there. There's a cut now on Don Fry's forehead. Big right hands over the top for Coleman. He's putting together some combination punches now with one arm. Fight a monster like Coleman. Fry turning out, attempting to sweep him off, and it's nothing. So I went back out there and I took my ass whooping just like a man should. End quote. Coleman just maintaining position here on top. Attempting to pass the defense of Don Fry. The Predator looking like prey here, stuck on his back. More mauling punches, a, a right hand from, from Coleman looks pretty good. Oh, big punch. Thuds off the face of Don Fry, a big right hand from Coleman. Now Fry's got wrist control on that far arm with his left hand. Attempting to block, but he's got absolutely no energy. Open hand, thumb sliding into the cuts, and eye of Don Fry for Mark Coleman, the fucking cheater. Get your goddamn hand off that man's face. Big grip on the fence as Mark Coleman as he repositions himself. Don Fry just laying here with the windpipe choke on. Oh, Coleman is begging for an armbar, but Fry's got nothing. Coleman is also very greasy, whereas Don Fry appears to be done. Done like dinner. Scarf hold, big neck crank here from Mark Coleman. And Don Fry uses the fence to sit up. He's too tired to stand. He barely gets to his feet as they walk back to the center. Coleman is a little tired here too. Both men with their hands on their knees. Breathing. The referee says get the fucking work. They are both exhausted. Tippy towing is Don Fry. Coleman backing away toward the fence. He's afraid of being punched here. Coleman jabs off. Don Fry in the southpaw stance attempting to land. Oh, he gets a good one two in before Coleman grabs his hips and drags him back down to the mat. A big knee lands for Coleman. He's, he's going for the choke here on Don Fry's back. He slips out to the side. What is he doing? Coleman, what are you doing? Coleman here. Unable to finish. Fry has absolutely no energy left in him. They're just laying here. A big hammer fist lands for Coleman. Clubbing with his left hand on the back of the neck of Don Fry, who scoots out in a burst of energy and attempts to regain his guard, but he's met with punches from Coleman. Fry attempting to push the hips away. Coleman is just crowding. Now we're inside control again. Don Fry's got nothing. All right, he stands up the action. All right, we're checking on the cuts on the face of Don Fry as Mark Coleman is exhausted, hands on knees again. Dr. Richard Istrico examining the face of Don Fry, who says he is fine. Leon Tabs. Everyone's exiting the Octagon trademark now. There's some swelling on both eyes. Don Fry, goddamn. And the action begins yet again. Both men moving in slow motion. Don Fry backing away to the center. Mark Holman. Backs away. He is exhausted. 
He's still got a little spring in his step, as Don Fry is truly exhausted. Coleman is attempting to bait Don Fry back to the fence. A jab for Coleman. Oh, oh no, now he's got uh, Don Fry in the front headlock as Fry shoots in, accidentally slips in. But he's now committed to a double leg, which he doesn't really want. Coleman using the defense to defend. He lands some drubbing hammers to the ear of, of the Predator Don Fry. Oh, Fry's in trouble here. He's attempting to use the fence to stand, but the big man is just... Oh, wait, he's, he stood up into the front headlock position, into the guillotine choke here. He's attempting to slip out of that, but he falls back down to the canvas, going for an outside single, which is choke territory. Here we've got Coleman taking the back mount again. Punches underneath the uh, underarm. Uppercuts under the underarm of Don Farai. A hook around the, the back of the head, a side guard. Coleman's going for the choke, but he doesn't have any energy. He attempts to pull Fry off top of him. He's just controlling the wrist now. Trying to pull something out. He's looking for another big punch with his right hand. But he doesn't see it. Some punches from the right hand into the liver of the Predator. Coleman clubbing over the top again. Coleman as Fry smashed against the fence here, turtled up. He's attempting to stand up, but there's nothing there for him. Elbows to the spine for Coleman. Oh, he attempts the knee bar, does Don Fry, but Coleman transitions to the choke. He doesn't have his hooks in. Oh, they are both breathing very heavily. Oh, Don Fry! escapes the back mount and he is now in the front headlock position as Mark Coleman is attempting to suck out the legs he's going for a choke, no he's got nothing power double picks up Don Fry Don Fry has an arm hooked over the, the top of the octagon trademark uppercuts for Coleman blasting Fry against the cage He's shooting in for another double leg. He's taken his hips down. And he's put Don Fry back on his back again. An open hand on his face. He's, he's attempting to punch over the top now. Coleman has swollen both eyes of Don Fry shut nearly. Fry is just now clubbing with left hands as if to say, fuck you, kill me. Big punches from the right arm of Coleman Land over the guard, and he's he's in the scarf hole position now again, in, in side control now. Bad camera angle, he attempts to land a knee, but he's not even attempting to, to get past the defense of Fry's, uh, Fry's near arm. Also, Don Fry not attempting to stand up, he's got no energy. Coleman again trying that knee. Coleman may have gotten a, a second wind. I don't think so. He's attempting to punch again. Don Fry unable to stand up again. Big knee lands for Coleman. Some blood leaking from that initial injured right eye of Don Fry. Headbutt from Coleman. And Big John has stood up the action again. Blood streaked across the face of Don Fry. Nope, it's it's over. He's saying that's it. I think we're just looking at the shell shock face of Mark Coleman sitting on a stool. Nope, that's it. He's gonna call it a TKO victory. For Mark the Hammer Coleman. Mark 
Coleman emerged as the dominant, if preposterously raw, force after unseating Don Fry, and that raw force alone was enough to overwhelm the undersized Superman that had been surfing the crest of a meteoric rise to power. Mark had proven himself as a tournament fighter, winning against the second best outside of Hoist Gracie. This was an essential attribute for any athlete looking to make his mark in this Wild West or Wild South era. Not only because it was a tournament format, but because it catapulted a competitor immediately into the mind of the fans, past the UFC logo. What with an emerging motley of familiar faces fighting for the front of each promotional poster. So with his next appearance, on the very next card, Coleman was poised to propel himself into the pantheon of potential greats. And with his raw wrestling alone, and I cannot overemphasize the raw. Raw, like the kind of steak that a lion eats. Raw like a still-bleeding wildebeest. His physique and instinct were the most evidently essential elements of his success. So, if he could string together a solid set of skills, optimistically speaking, he could become unstoppable. Coleman proved this in the next tournament. Not that anyone saw it, given that it only sold 92,000 buys. And maybe rightfully so, being one of the weirdest set of unfortunate circumstances to befall an event, maybe in the UFC's history. It was the 20th of September, 1996, in gorgeous Augusta, Georgia. It was subtitled, The Proving Ground. And in the opening round, Brian Johnston of the American Kickboxing Academy easily TKOs his opponent in under 30 seconds. Tank Abbott returns after a period of suspension stemming from an incident he had outside the cage with Brazilian black belt Alan Goez at the Puerto Rico show, fueled by a head swimming with alcohol. He defeats Sam Adkins in two minutes, which is about as long as he can sustain continuous strain. This fool is fresh off the bar stool and it's clear that he did not train. Jerry Bolander, of the Lion's Den, faces world jiu-jitsu champion Fabio Gurgel and wins by decision, holding top position against the fence, using death grips on the cage to keep himself first from being taken down in a bad spot and then from being reversed and swept onto his back. He is unable to continue into the semifinals presumably because he mangled his fingers by clutching the chain link so tightly that it bent open. The two winners of the alternate bouts of the tournament compete for the fastest finish to replace the first injured fighter, but that alternate, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu world champion Roberto Trevern, had shattered his hand while punching his opponent into submission, whereas the other winner, Scott Ferrozo, had not. So, Scott Ferrozo instead replaces Jerry Bolander, the man who welcomed him to the sport with his first defeat at UFC 8, the show where Tank Abbott was suspended, to face Tank Abbott in the semifinal round. It's a small world. It's a small, octagonal world. And after 18 minutes of sloppy walrus slugging, the man with the bigger gut wins the judge's decision. And now Ferrozo poised to fulfill his first improbable promise, is set to challenge the juggernaut champion of the last tournament, the Hammer, Mark Coleman, in the final round. And Mark Coleman came to claim the championship like Jupiter. Here we have the returning UFC champion, Mark the Hammer Coleman, against pudgy Mexican man with the discipline of ASAX whatever the fuck that is and the action begins Coleman stops immediately to the center in an orthodox dance now oh it 
Leading him with a jab that can exploit well. Coleman also got hit in the eye. Shoots a double on an advancing Sanchez. Coleman landing some punches over the top. Sanchez, oh, he's going for the head and arm. The scarf hole choke. He's, he's crushing the head and spine now. With this neck crank here. Sanchez helpless on his back. And he's tapping. And that's that's that. That's In the opening round, Coleman had crushed a can named Julian, Julian Sanchez. Sanchez. What was his name? There's not a whole lot to say about the performance other than it displayed the attributes we'd already become accustomed to seeing. 44 seconds. What Just a reiteration of the raw fury yeah. on grotesque display for anyone watching from the locker room monitors of the sheer power and relentlessness of his wrestling. In the semifinals, he faced the other fast finisher, Brian Johnston. Six foot four, 235 pound, Brian Johnston. In the semifinal round against the hammer here, he looks unconcerned. And the action begins. Coleman advancing in a boxing stance. Brian Johnston is crouched low here, with his hands down at his waist. Coleman is taking the middle, and so far, Brian Johnston, there we go, he comes in with a straight right, but Coleman moves out of the pocket. Johnston lands a solid low kick. Coleman is no doubt not eager to take any more of those. I expect him to shoot. And after eating some visibly effective low kicks. Oh, another. Bounces Coleman backward. Coleman is hesitant here. Lackadaisical, one might say. Hmm, a third low kick is landed for Johnston, who lands another in the middle of an explosive double leg takedown that drives him against the fence, and he drops to the mat. Coleman is in his half guard, and he's cradling, hugging tight. Coleman bull rushes the smaller man to the mat, holding down the upper body of Coleman with double underhooks as Brian Johnston attempting, and never lets him see daylight again, to buck him off. Coleman trying to establish his base. He's just relaxed, riding. Oh, now he's punching the head. Punching the back of the head, the nape of the neck of Brian Johnston. Hmm. Coleman attempting to free his head for some headbutting. He's, he doesn't have a good angle for this. Being overly elevated. Brian Johnston has sort of just a loose grip on his leg here, spinning the half go. Coleman turns Johnston to the fence. Johnston's head is wedged against the chain link now. He's trying to make space. Coleman gets a little separation and lands a solid headbutt. Oh, another one he's trying. A few more headbutts now that he's in good position. Some clubbing punches coming over the top from Mark Coleman. Brian Johnson wants to hold. Oh, big John McCarthy stopped the fight. I didn't see a submission, but because Brian Johnston turned, Big John McCarthy just raises the hand of Coleman. But uh, I think it was an early stoppage. Not that I think Brian Johnston was putting up much of a fight, let me tell you that. Backstage, Scott Ferrozo is being attended to by the growing number of individuals expressing concern over an enormous gash, gaping just above his eyeball that he'd sustained while rubbing tummies with Tank Abbott. Now, in my memory, it really wasn't bleeding obnoxiously, but I suppose, if I'm honest, I have to say that it was increasingly threatening to expose his skull in the throes of his post-fight interview enthusiasm. And as they say, beauty is only skin deep. This dude is ugly enough to begin with. Ferrozo's trainer, for whom he credits with his success, Don Fry, I told you it was a small world. Don Fry 
under medical suspension for the ass whooping he took from Coleman in the last show is cage side when Scott has told the news that he will not be allowed to continue. If Ferrozo's fat face fell off in the middle of his inevitable mauling, they might have had to pack it in right then and fold this circus up for good. But in retrospect, the SEG staff might have even made the decision to defy the doctor and fill that hole in Scott's skull with Vaseline and adrenaline-soaked cotton and send him back out there. You see, there were no alternates available to replace him. He himself was a goddamn alternate. Every other available competitor in the locker room is injured. And as Art Davey, the matchmaker, makes his way through to give his condolences and explain the situation to all involved, he gives one last ditch effort and offers Don Fry the fight, who allegedly quipped, I thought it was suspended, Art. No, actually, he, his voice wasn't quite that deep back then. It was more like, um, I thought it was suspended, Art. So Mark Coleman has been declared the champion. What happened tonight, Jerry Bolander got injured. Scott Ferrozo took his place. Ferrozo beat Tank Abbott. Unanimous decision in the semifinals. Ferrozo unable to continue. They went to the other alternate who had won earlier tonight, Alberto Troven. He had broken his right hand. Coleman has no one to fight in the championship. So it ends up that Mark Coleman wins UFC. Is there no one else? Is there no one else? Coleman is led back to the Octagon, trademark, to hold an awkward interview with Jeff Blatnick about the dominance of wrestling, and this is like 19 days after Stone Cold Steve Austin first cut his famous promo that propelled him into pro wrestling stardom. So Mark Coleman <laughs> ends every trailing statement with, and, and that's the bottom line, until the production team can run out the clock on the pay-per-view and the audience and attendance are treated to a wrestling exhibition between the new champion and one of his training partners, a man whom I imagine will feature prominently in future episodes of the show. May you rest in peace, Mr. Randleman. Now, it was no Motor City Madness with the Face Punch Moratorium, but UFC 11 was a dismal failure nonetheless. The tournament storyline fizzled before completion, making the main event a ghost of an idea of a fight, and the show even lacked the excitement of an amazing action bout like the one between Fry and Batesh. It sold in a paltry number of homes and ultimately made no headway in the product's development. Semaphore was eager to wash the taste out of the fans' mouth with the next event, building towards something meaningful, and established the second Ultimate Ultimate Tournament champion. So, a lot of people were probably a little relieved when Mark Coleman contracted a viral illness and was unable to compete. I like to think that he was wiped out on a course of antibiotics to battle back all the bad pussy he was probably running through. He still managed to make the promotional poster, you know, subject to change, along with Don Fry, Tank Abbott, and Ken Shamrock. Shamrock came into the tournament with a bad attitude and a new tactic of aggressive ground punching in lieu of a strategic finish. He faced Brian Johnston in this exact manner, initially eschewing any attempt at a submission but broke his hand all to pieces after unleashing a flurry of rights to the face. So it was not incredibly effective, considering he had to catch a forearm choke to finally finish the fight. So, after bowing out of yet another tournament, he exits the sport entirely for three years, electing to sign with the WWF and make a run at pro wrestling. Chemo hadn't managed to make the promotional material, but won his opening round bout against the polar bear Paul Varlins, who was too exhausted to continue into the semifinals. Gary Goodridge had been finished in his opening round bout by exhaustion in an honestly incredible effort against Don Fry in their first rematch, striking with him in the clinch and refusing to be taken down until he could land in top control. But he was unable to wear down the Predator, 
who eventually escaped and reversed the position, and when Gary Goodridge's back hit the canvas, he submitted, spent and discouraged. They say fatigue makes cowards of us all. Tank Abbott, however, is not suffering from fatigue this time around. It appears as though he may have done some jogging, or perhaps is just getting to land the big punches before he runs out of wind. His path to the final round fared the easiest, and it seemed like he might have the staying power to sweep the field and intercept the claim that many thought Mark Coleman rightfully had to the ultimate, ultimate title. And the action begins. Oh, Tank Abbott immediately clips Warsham with the power right hand, pushes him to the fence, but Warsham is dropping knees. Tank Abbott, a good double leg. Stopped by the overhelping grip of Warsham, grabbing on the fence. Warsham now raining punches into the neck of Abbott as he is taken to the mat now. He's got a butterfly in. The tank is looking to posture and punch with his right hand, and he does so, connecting two times before passing into side control. Abbott has Warsham flat on his back here, but he's inactive so far. Attempting to advance is Tank Abbott, but he is crowded and blocked by the cage. He can go for a double wrist lock here. Uh, he lost that now. He, what? He's trying to put himself into a triangle by passing on the uh, opposite side of the cage, but that is ineffective. He's back in the high guard, the long guard, rather. A cow wash him, who's now still flat on his back. Tank Abbott standing. Attempts to dive in with a punch, but it gets nowhere. Doesn't connect with a couple of more power punches as he falls back down into the open guard of Cal Washam. Headbutt from Tank as he postures. Washam pushes him away. The long guard pushing him out of punching range. Tank stacks. Washam on his shoulders here. Tank collapses back down into his open guard. No punches. Tank Abbott. Trying to get this former Marine pregnant. Laying in the missionary position. Warsham pushes away. He's attempting to stand again. Tank Abbott attempting to control the hips. He's got one hand on an ankle. As he's pinning the hips here. He's trying to go for that big punch again. But he's got no ability. He goes to the body. Three punches down to the body. Warsham attempts a kick. Warsham punching to the neck. As Abbott comes back into the missionary position. Warsham's head pinned against the fence. He's now sitting duck for an overhand if Tank can muster it. A hopping punch is nothing. Oh, a big punch and Warsham is tapping. Warsham is now complaining that he... He hit him after he started, which is not true. And he hit him after he tapped. And the action begins. Tank disrespectfully walking in. His front hand low, and he hits Nelmark with a jab immediately, which backs him to the fence. He's all over him, pinning him to the fence and hitting him into the, into the body. Attempting a takedown now over Big Slam to the elation of the crowd from D.L. Abbott in the, in the guillotine grip now on the mat. In the guillotine grip of the Sandman, Steve Melmore. He's calm about his escape as he pushes away the hip. Pushes Melmark into the fence. Oh, Nelmark gets up and he is immediately clipped by a wild right, and another, and another. Nelmark eats a left, three lefts. Oh, and a vicious left uppercut as he breaks off the fence. Tank, relentless action as he's as he's punching and pushing Nelmark to the uh, to the cage. Oh, oh, a big shot knocks Nelmark unconscious. He is collapsed 
into his own footprint, kind of came to the side. A vicious knockout. We haven't seen one that good since his first appearance in UFC 8. 7. Signs of pre-senile dementia. Pugilistic. After Tank brutally KOs Steve Nelmark, he has the next semi-final fight to recover through. And it's Don Fry versus Mark Hall. A rematch in the UFC and technically the third fight between them. With an average duration of about 8 minutes. With Mark Hall taking a grueling beating that will wear down Fry's future punches. At least, that's what everyone was expecting to occur. But as it will actually unfold, in a similar manner to the way that Tank was once screwed before by Oleg Taktarov and Anthony Macias in UFC 6, these two fighters share the same manager and conspire to orchestrate an easy victory for Fry, who catches a quick Achilles hold, the match lasting a total of 20 seconds. From Let's Get It On, Referee Big John McCarthy's autobiography. Quote, Unfortunately, this night was the second time I felt I was refereeing a fixed bout. In the semifinals, Don Fry and Mark Hall met in a rematch of their UFC 10 bout. In the first encounter, Fry had beaten the piss out of Hall, who refused to give up. Here, though, Fry ankle locked Hall to advance to the finals without breaking a sweat. The fight struck me as odd. Fry, a bread-and-butter wrestler and swing-for-the-fences puncher, had never won a fight by leg lock, and Hall practically fell into the submission. I also knew both fighters were managed by the same guy. End of quote. That quote does not sound like Big John McCarthy. I, I, I couldn't do a Big John McCarthy impression because of how untrue this... Autobiograph autobiographical it does not sound like something Big John would say um I'm gonna say it like this <clears throat> it was a work for the final Fry's pre-fight plan was to avoid a punching exchange with Abbott and put him down where his power could be neutralized and the action begins they meet After eating the, the jab in the opening seconds that nearly knocked him unconscious. Tank with that low guard. Oh, he jabs Fry down to the mat. He's blasting him against the cage. He utterly failed to execute any of that. Fry back Instead, punching into the pocket. Attempting to counter clip him. And brawling in the clinch oh, with the most food slugger in the game. Straight right hand. With a weight advantage of 50 pounds. They're in a shootout now. And Tank is giving the best of it. Oh! Tank lands a solid right hand. As Fry punches into the clinch. Uh, that was a fire fight! Oh, another overhand right. After a, a left up on the cut was stifled. Don Fry is getting battered all over the place in this clinch. As Tank Abbott has landed three or four more punches. Oh, he's been clipped. He's flat on his stomach doing the job of the hut defense. The slug guard. Fry's taking the back and he's flattening him out here. He's put on the rear naked choke and he's squeezing across the jawline. Oh, he's lost it. Tank is sitting up to defend. He's attempting to peel uh, Fry's legs off, which is stupid. And Fry once again has it under the chin. He's locked his hands up. Unbelievably. Tank Abbott is tapping. At the battle I call for a bloody. Oldest mistake in the book. Protect your neck. This would be Don Fry's last appearance in the UFC although ultimately not his last in MMA. But in the next six months, he'd make a deal with New Japan Pro Wrestling for the next six years. Now, I never did watch any Japanese Puroresu until all that AJ Styles hype, and then it was just like a clip of a brief murdering by the Bullet Club or something like that. I don't know. And I don't know anything about American Pro Wrestling post-NWO. Wolfpack for life. Oh. So, just like Shamrock, 
here is where I said farewell to Don Fry. And I guess he actually did farewell. Um, but his much anticipated rematch with Mark Coleman vanished into the void for the foreseeable future. Instead, it's Dan Severn that Coleman will face at UFC 12 Judgment Day for the first official UFC heavyweight title in Niagara Falls, New York. The atmosphere surrounding the event was electric. Success here would put SEG on the New York map and establish the UFC as the face of an emerging sport, poised to promote their biggest fight in Madison Square Garden, mecca of pugilism. While Governor George Pataki and Senator Roy Goodman attempted to organize legislation that would ban the sport from the state of New York, Bob Myrowitz had quietly hired a lobbyist by the oddball name of James Featherston Haw, who helped them bribe their way into legalization and regulation under the State Athletic Commission. In fact, against all odds, New York was actually the first state to officially make it legal and also, I think, the first to make it officially illegal. Um, but that might have already happened by now. But then also, ultimately, the last state to make it legal. Again. Now, this legalization shit was wild news to the aggressive entrepreneurs of the other promotion. Battlecade Extreme Fighting. The guys who got arrested in Canada. They'd been at it again, with their third event held in Tulsa, Oklahoma a place where they will let you get your fool skull stomped by a bull if you so have the balls. When the legalization became official in New York State, in anticipation of SEG's success in Niagara Falls, Battlecade announced a show at Madison Square and then proceeded to promote it in the most perverse way possible. Plus, I bet they didn't bribe anybody. The end result, in Rudy Giuliani era New York, was an athletic commission which regulated the sport into true grotesquerie. At this point in its evolution, I can think of only four rules off the top of my head. Not four pages, but four bullet points you could squeeze into the margin of a single page. No biting, no eye gouging, no fish hooking, and after the bolander Gurgel debacle of UFC 11, no grabbing the fence. Ridiculously raw, no doubt, and in need of clearly defined standards in terms of referee enforcement, judging, equipment, weight class, medical examination, drug screening, and on and on. The commission produced a 111-page tome of absolute bullshit, shattering the foundation of the sport to the point where it was legal to perform but no longer feasible to promote. Amongst the rules, just to point out an incredibly idiotic item, was that the competitors had to wear headgear. The amateur boxing kind, not the wrestling kind. Which was legal to grab and throw them by. Genius. Just face mask a motherfucker around the octagon trademark until his neck breaks. And the octagon trademark had to be enlarged from an already enormous 32 to a preposterous 40 feet across. There were other things. It doesn't matter because it was all horse shit and it all happened under the nose of SEG for as long as it could. Bob Myrowitz himself was denied a copy of the rules by the State Athletic Commission and first learned of them through an interview with some press outlet. I'm gonna guess it was the Times. Anyway, Bob Myrowitz and Big John McCarthy are stuck in some New York courtroom demonstrating their numerous objections to a prejudicially disinterested judge, almost certainly unable to wade through all of them, considering it's 111 pages, the day before UFC 12 Judgment Day is scheduled to take place. Battlecade Extreme Fighting had had to move their venue for the very first event on a single day's notice. They were short-sighted but unflappable, and that was the epitome of what had been done so far with the UFC. They had run an initial marketing campaign that was wildly successful and produced rabid opponents and was an easy target. 
and the content created further publicity. It was a vicious cycle, and now that they'd attempted to regulate and legitimize and failed, the only option was to embrace the chaos they were faced with and the fallout from extreme fighting and retreat back to the wild south. On a caravan of propeller planes to Dothan, Alabama. On a single day's notice. They partnered with a local radio station and they gave away tickets just to have an audience in attendance. They managed about 3,100 drunken rednecks, which is perfect. The card featured two four-man tournaments, an over 200 and an under 200 pound division, from which two highly touted prospects who had been emerging on the scene claimed their rightful place amongst the top talent. The first was the under 200 pound Jerry Bolander of the Lion's Den, who had defeated Brazilian Jiu Jitsu world champion Fabio Gurgel by decision in what some considered a disingenuous way by clutching the fence for assistance and keeping top position and stalling, a tactic made illegal as a direct result of the outrage that fight had generated within the Jiu Jitsu community. This time around, though, there would be no stalling. Jerry Bolanda, Rainy Martinez, the action has begun. I don't believe that the announcer has announced the fighters. Bolander's breakthrough performance came suddenly. Bolanda initiating with the inside low kick against Rainy Martinez. Apparently too suddenly for oh, the announcer. Shoots deep. Rainy sprawls. He's got a nice front headlock, but Jerry Bolanda transitions to a single. He's got his head on the inside here. Rainy Martinez should be able to guillotine him, but he's passed into side control and he saved himself. We let the fighters kick off the event in anonymity. Bare Knuckle Bolander attempting to beat the head. Jerry had had a mediocre run up to this turn. Uh, it looks like still stuck in the half guard of Rainy Martinez. Despite displaying a rapidly developing skill How set. How get back into the half guard on the other side? Martinez is attempting to scramble his legs in. And fence holding antics aside, his main problem had been the sheer size of his previous opponents. Bolanda now has passed into side control. Oh, he got he got reversed momentarily by Rainy Martinez, who's almost fought back to his feet before being taken down again. Bull rushed over, and Bolanda has his back against the fence. Just enormous pressure as he finishes with a rear naked choke. He just, he just steamrolled this man. Here, though, he ran through men who did not have this advantage. Jerry Boland, a powerful individual. He was the biggest fish in the little pond. In the final round, he anticipated a showdown with a Japanese veteran named Yoshiki Takahashi. But Takahashi had gone to a 15-minute decision against Brazilian veteran Valiji Ishmael and was replaced by the alternate. Nick Sanzo. Nick Sanzo, jiu-jitsu fighter against Jerry Bolander, facing this alternate here in the second round of the final round of the lightweight tournament, and the action has begun. Tentative touching on the outside of Sanzo's shot, a single. Bolander is defending. Looking for the, the pretzel maneuver here from wrestling. Oh, he's got a guillotine choke on this man. No, lets that go. Delivers a knee to the head of Nick Sanzo. A little fish, eaten without hesitation. Oh, he's double underhooks and he's exposed his back to the mat in a crucifix position as Sanzo hits the mat, tapping. A crucifix submission for Jerry Bolander. It's the opening round of the four-man heavyweight tournament. Vitor Belfour versus Trey Teligman. And the action begins. Vitor Belfour in a southpaw stance. The other breakout star in the heavyweight tournament. Bouncing around. Gloved Vitor Belfour with no shoes. Teligman shoes, no gloves. It was a 19-year-old Brazilian named Teligman. 
Pinned back against the fence, a blow is yet to be thrown. Vitor Belfort, the phenom. Oh, Vitor Belfort has won the footwork battle, and he is a BJJ black belt under the tutelage of Carlson Gracie, nephew of the old man, Alia. Hit him with the running cross. Belfort was such a phenom Four that crosses. he had the whole school accompanying Lefts him. Lefts and rights against the fence. Oh, and he went for a double. Certainly first in New York, and then... But again, puts the running cross on him. A day's notice later. Machine gun punches. All the way down to Alabama. Lefts and rights. Straights for Belfort. He'd even been offered to compete, but Bel Telegman has battled back into the clinch. He's eventually punched under the pseudonym of Victor Grace. Level to the mat to simultaneously Americanize him and legitimize his hype train. Attempting to defend with the with the high guard, a spacious guard, but Vitor Belfort, the black belt, has passed the side control. He's got one arm trapped. He's cradling the far leg. He looked good getting off the bus, so to speak. Oh, he's sitting up and punching now. Oh, elbows over the top of Vitor Belfort. Vitor Belfort by TKO. And he blitz past Lion's Den prospect Trey Teligman with his blazing hand speed. The final round of the heavyweight tournament. Vitor Belfort, the phenom, is taking on the pit bull, Scott Ferrozo. Of course... He did have a strength and conditioning coach who was so swollen and vascular. And the action began. He was the color of a bright plum. Nobody's making a move. This meaning Vitor was loaded to the gills with the best gear a Brazilian bodybuilder can buy. But the rotund one, as Tank Abbott is calling him, Scott Ferrozo, is taking the center. He was undersized for a heavyweight. Jump forward. Coming in at just over the 200 pound mark. Vitor is waiting for his chance to explode and he does so with a straight left out of the pipe. Hits him with a second but collapses the big man of the mat. But he was so fast that these lumbering oafs could not compete. Vitor Belfort has him in side control but he scrambles up. He's not looking to get him into a holding position. He's taken the back. Landed a right hand. Two right hands over the top. Devastating punches to the nape of the neck. And that's it. Big John McCarthy steps in. He also could not comprehend to the protest. Oh, for Rozo, it's a it's a melee. Or cope with his ability to crush them so quickly. Extra security has to be called in to restrain Scott Ferrozo, who is upset at this stoppage. The entirety of Carlson Gracie has stormed the octagon. Trademark. And they're chanting something in Portuguese. All right, and Ferrozo goes to make his peace, or something. He still doesn't look happy. Speaking of the referee now, and the cut man Leon Tabs is overlooking him. Here in the replay, we're gonna see these left straights from Vitor. These left crosses here. He establishes dominant foot position in the open guard, the open striking guard, and blasts for Rozo to two lead. I mean, he might have thrown like a jab as a feint, but it was basically two lead lefts that stunned him, put him on his back, began blasting. Ferrozo covers up. Big John McCarthy comes in and stops. The entirety of Vitor's team rushes the octagon, trademark. Apparently, Big John will not let you fight on. As though he has just won the gold medal in the Olympics. If you lay flat on your face with your hands behind but your he head. He hasn't even won the gold in the UFC. Yet. As though waiting to be arrested. That prize is reserved for the winner of the main event. The Ultimate Fighting Heavyweight Championship. Two dreadnoughts on a collision course. UFC 5, Ultimate Ultimate, and Super Fight Champion, Dan the Beast Severn, against undefeated UFC 10 and 11 Champion, Mark the Hammer Coleman. And the action begins. Coleman stalks to the center. In an orthodox stance, seven, southpaw. Coleman steps in with a jab. Seven shoots. Coleman sprawls, has the front headlock. Now the hammer should look for knees here. He's got a strong grip on the front headlock position. But he loses it as seven slips out. Oh, throwing big punches into the pocket is the hammer, and he clocks him with the right hand. 
stepping over the jab next. A hard English jab. Oh, Coleman had the mount momentarily, lost it off of the sprawl. Uh, now he has taken the back here, the, the wrestling back hold. The hammer here on the back of the beast. Drubbing the head. Drubbing the back of the neck. Coleman will be looking to punch here. Oh, an uppercut under the arm here. Lands for Mark Coleman. As he drops the champion. Attempting to push him flat on the mat. Alright, Mark Coleman has assumed the mount as Seven attempted to turn out and botched. He's holding down the upper body of the hammer so as to avoid the ground and pound. The hammer slipped out of the scarf hold. Oh, he's looking for the, the neck crank here. Seven is attempting to escape. Oh, he needs to roll this man deep over. Hmm, he can't quite he can't quite escape here. He's being choked out here and squeezing is the hammer. He doesn't quite have it here. The beast is surviving. Stuck here in the scarf hole. Pinned on the mat. Right, he's cranking now. Oh. Seven attempting to eye gouge. Pushing the face away. He's tapping. Mark Coleman has just gooned the old man, the beast, crushed his skull in the steroid grip with his iron biceps. The Hammer is the heavyweight champion. Next time on the Cage of History. The first look that I had at uh, martial arts fighting, there was people knocking them other down, sitting on top of them and smashing them in the face. There was no referee, there was nothing. It was terrible. I mean, I've seen people put repeatedly getting smashed in the face with a guy sitting on top of them. That's not a sport. That's, that's a throwback to the Roman Colosseum. Episode 7. The Death of NHB. Part 1.